feel free to download the full podcast on all major streaming sites, including iTunes, Apple Music and Spotify. Also, check out the KRN store and grab yourself the latest KRN merchandise and accessories using the keyword KRN10 for 10% discount on all purchases. Thanks for listening and enjoy the interview. Ended up going to Holland and uh, that's where it all started really. That was in 87, was when I did the first smuggle. Within a year I, I was on my way to I could have. Everybody, all the guards knew me, everything. Managed to be able to get Kurtz out now and again up to the wing. I'd go in his cell and play chess and have a little chat. Mm. And then it started to work out that I'd been to the places he'd been to. And, you know, we just sort of bit it off together. One, 1,000 was the one that Kurtz got charged with. Yep. And another 3,000 separate, 2,000 in, in Holland. Yep. And another 1,000 in Belgium. Oh my God. All, all of that went at the same time. But the Colombians never knew. That was it, everybody got wiped up. And I realised later that them questions that I don't know had the right answer. I won't come in at that point. KRN TV, we're bringing the most exciting interviews from around the world. Today we are in Shepherd's Bush with an absolute blinder of an interview with Stephen Mee. Stephen, thank you very much for giving me the time. Hello. Um, so for people who don't know, Stephen's got the most incredible story when he obviously got into a life of crime at a really early age. He ended up falling into the world of smuggling. Um, upon getting, or due to get a really big jail sentence, he ended up springing from the prison van. Uh, upon there, he ended up going out to Holland, um, where he got involved in big time drug smuggling with Curtis Warren. Uh, Stephen was dealing directly with the Cali cartel, I believe. Um, okay. And then he ended up getting uh, a huge raid in Holland uh, on the, upon the arrival of 400 kilos coming into the country. Um, and he ended up getting sentenced to eight years in the Dutch jail. Um, he ended up serving five years of that and must say in a triple cat A before then getting brought back to Britain to finish off the 22 year sentence um, upon which he served 11 of when he got back to Britain. So an absolute insane story um, that I think needs sharing. Um, like I said, Stephen, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. And I think it's important to go back to your childhood, like I say, to see what sort of sculpted you into the person you became who was willing to sort of go to these sort of lems where we'd be going to South America and taking these risks and stuff like this. So talk to us about where you were brought up and a little bit about your childhood if possible. Yeah, I was brought up in a place called Newton Heath, Manchester. Poor area at the time, still is now I suppose. But I uh, was into a big family, nine of us, nine children. Mother and father. Father always worked, my mother was always poorly. And uh, more or less it was my mother who started me to become a criminal. Sending a shopping with my younger siblings. We used to go shopping with a, a five pound list and she used to give us two pound. And if we didn't come home without, with, with it all, we got a bit of an hiding off, off her. So I was in trouble because she was, she was always drinking, but drinking and taking prescription drugs, the mixture was terrible. But she always pushed us out of the house and sent us shopping. Mm. So that was the first start of it, and then we realised, even at that early age, I'm talking about nine years old now, shopping, taking uh, full trolleys out of Tesco at nine years old with my two little brother and sister. And it just led from there. Once I realised that I could do that and take the whole lot out instead of paying the two pound, then I had two pound. Two pound was a lot of money, three pound, five pounds now and again. It's a lot of money in those days. Absolutely, and uh, how, how you did at school at them sort of times, and obviously, yeah, I was at school. I did the, the primary school at nine years old. I got caught for robbing my own primary school. As I was in the woodwork class and put some bolts of wood in, in the, the quick release for the emergency exit, mm. stuck in. I, I don't, don't even know why or how I, th I thought about that, but just something I did. And then 
with pocket full of change and shopping and bought all their own because it was like a little village type community then. Everybody knew about it before I even got home, they knew. The corner shop man had told the, the police and the police had gone round to my dad and my dad battered me, the police battered me. The school tried to kick me out at nine years old. But uh, yeah, that's more or less how it all started and I just led from there. So that was your first arrest then? Did you get arrested on that occasion? Yeah. No, I, no, just warned. Just warned? Yeah, got arrested at, uh, I think the first one was 10, for another primary school further up the, down the road. Mm. Got arrested for that. The first recorded one was then. Uh, got a lot of bad little criminal things, you know, stupid things from childhood. Got about 30 odd criminal offences. Mm. But all petty stuff. Well, I say all petty stuff, one, one of them was, uh, Section 18 at 13. Jesus. Which is not good. But that was uh, Newton, Ethan, and Clayton was two separate things. In the, in the middle, they had a valley with a river running down it. And all the kids from school, school holidays, used to run down at the Claytoners. And then the Claytoners run away. And then they'd get a bit of courage up and they'd run after them. And it'd just be like that all day long. It was something everybody did. In the end, I think it got quite violent. But. Uh, Throw a stick in it and someone on the head, and they knew it was me. And I cut his head open and all that. I got a section 18, dragged out of school. They didn't let us back in to uh, school for quite a while. And then uh, got caught stealing cars at, uh, at 13. And it was quite about 15 cars in TIC. They mugged me off, obviously, as a kid. Gone in, they, they, we'd been out all day messing about in cars and we've gone up to a place called Greenfields which is at the top of Hall Moss and it's in the middle of nowhere on the, on the Yorkshire Saddle with Moss and we ran out of petrol at the top. The, uh, seen a car coming, it was about three o'clock in the morning this car coming in and it turned out to be a police jeep but by the time they took us to the top and he's asked us where we was but you bear in mind I was a little kid really and he should have just took us home took us to the top because they couldn't, there was out of radio contact, he let us go. We'd gone down the other side, trying to get home. This is going over the Yorkshire Moors, at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, bits of cold. Stole another car to, to get home in. I tried to lead up the sport and uh, was just so tired I fell asleep in the car and got woke up by the police from Greenfields and they dragged us out of the car and kicked us down the road to police station then got my dad and he kicked us all the way home and then my mum kicked us all the way to bed sort of thing. Do you ever get young offenders or postal? Yeah I've got DC. Which is? Three months uh, detention centre. Yeah. It just came out at the time as well they call it the short sharp shock. Was that military style one? Oh unbelievable military style. Uh, again just from the beginning you just they, I think they, they've been prosecuted quite a lot this place. They used to beat it up for fun. The so-called guards. Uh, they used to get up in the morning, six o'clock, in a little vest, blue shorts, and then old fashioned plimsolls. And you stand outside, and then you have to do a five mile run, come back to a circuit, and then go and clean your dorm. But if they caught you doing anything wrong in between, they just used to be proper punches, you know, grown men. They used to lever everybody there. It was a short, sharp shock. But Is it not enough? No, nowhere near enough. Well, came out. I think within a few weeks, I was back to stealing cars again. Mm. But then, then I came to the end of school days. It sounds mad after doing all that. I'm still at school. Uh, they tried to ban me from school when they caught us for the cars, but we uh, managed to get back in school for a bit. Never did any qualifications. But then we went to the uh, did careers day sort of thing. We took some pictures in there and. Uh, Produce the pictures to the career block, and he said, "Oh, there's a job available in graphic art and design, and day release, and serve your apprenticeship for sign writing." So I went down that way. But yes. it only lasted a couple of years. Yeah. Well, stealing cars to come on with, you know, it's ridiculous. Crazy. Right. And so these times here, were you um, drinking drugs involved? You no, drugs? I've never, never drank. Never drunk drugs. Drugs. No. You weren't smoking weed or anything as a kid. No. Cigarettes. Didn't even hear of it as a kid. Cigarettes, nothing like that. I think I was 20 when I heard about cannabis. Mm. No, cigarettes neither. So yeah, you've always been 
So you've never drunk throughout your life? Just always... No, I was into cycling. Fair play. At 14 I joined uh, Manchester Wheelers. And they called me the new Belgium road race champion because you know, of my legs. I've got big legs. And uh, stayed with that for quite a few years. Thing, but even then, I was stealing bikes to to keep, you know, to buy myself a decent bike, and mm. you know, there was always that in, in my mind. It was easier to steal it than work for it. What was your aspirations as a child? What were your dreams of, sort of when you were growing up? What did you want to? What was the dream job? What was the dream for you? It was art. It always has been art. You know, the the, 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 the cartoons that I did when I was 13, 14, when I left. When I started working there, the first thing I did was start doing pop art pictures of Jimi Hendrix and people, you know, the doors and things like that, and going to nightclubs and selling them out, outside at 15, 16, as soon as I was uh, at it. And then, again, just a few years go by, I got married, bought my own house, worked on a building site next to a police station, and on the building site at night time, I was going out pinching bikes and spraying them up and selling them at the shop. Which gave me the money to do other things and bought a house and all that, and then got caught for lending somebody my van. I did something in it, I ended up getting a couple of years for that. You did? Yeah. So that was your first in the time in adult jail, was it? Eight, it was, yeah, adult jail, 18, it was two years, but they, they made a mistake, they had to reduce it to six months, and the people said that it wasn't him, it was us. I got out on appeal, uh, but yeah, that's. It was a start, and then in there you meet people. Just, that's the way it goes, isn't it? Mm. You just keep stepping up. And then I started again. But I was always working out a bike shop. Uh, started doing bikes, selling bikes in the, in the BMX times. So I had quite a bit of that going. But again, even then, it was people. Oh, something went wrong with one of the cars. I had so I bought an engine which was stolen, and I got nicked for that. And just that sort of start snowballed it then. And mm. while, while I was first in, in jail, my wife divorced me. Uh, so I'd come out and I'm on my own then. Uh, everything went wild then from there. Really just bumbling from one crime to another. Yeah. So that had a bad effect and you obviously had a leave in you then. As well, yeah. I suppose, but you don't notice that at the time, do you? It's only when you reflect on it. Mm. But uh, when I ended up in. Kirkham Open Prison, absconded from there in 87. Why? I was just going over to meet a girl. I only had five months to do of an 18 month sentence. So, and then the alarm went off, somebody else went over but got seen. So I decided not to go back. Ended up going to Holland. And uh, that's where it all started, really. That was at 87. That was when I did the first smuggle. Within a year, I, I was on my way to Ecuador. Jesus, Siege. why not stick with the weeds? So obviously, let's talk about how you did the first trip then of uh, bringing the, I'm guessing it's back to obviously without incriminating yourself, it was bringing some cannabis back to, to uh, the UK. No, no, no. Yeah, the first ones, yeah, that, that was a, uh, that was just a comedy of errors, that. It wasn't even, you can't class that as a. So at these thing, times, yeah. were they hot on it at the border and stuff like this? No, not really. Drugs, especially no. coming back from France. Did you go back and come through France? Oh, different places, yeah. Yeah. France, Spain different places. But no, there, there wasn't onto it. The, the, the first smuggle was, uh, we, three of us, I put the money up, three of us decided to go and do it. We all booked together, so there was no chance of me separating. I'd supplied the money, I should have been stood back. But we all booked the flight together, a flight. We all drove down to Dover together, got three day passports together, because uh, you should get a, a three day passport then. You didn't need any ID, just a photograph, really. Just to get a three-day passport, and then we all came back together. But we'd smoked some of the cannabis. What what we did when we was in Holland, we didn't have any contacts there, nothing. Just going from coffee shop to coffee shop. Well, buying little bits. Of... No, trying to buy a kilo. I mean, we nearly got we got a few chase outs and things like that, and we ended up with uh, with the uh, thing of the Hell's Angels, one of their cafes. We didn't know it at the time, but this is how raw we was for it and we bought a kilo a big slab 1300 quid and uh, got it back five grand for it that was it Jeez, yeah, that started was, us off yeah geez, that got you the bag at that point and then it yeah. was just back and forth back and forth so i did a few of them and then before i knew it uh, we'd met quite a few people and one of them said you fancy doing a 
bit of a run. This was the, the one from Ecuador. So, so what, you met some South Americans in Holland while you were there. Yeah. So were you Jewish? Were Jew you, at that time, one of them was Jewish, Jewish, actually. Jewish? Yeah, yeah. Jewish and South American between and they put together a thing in the needed people who, who carry it through. And uh, a few of my friends did it as well. They got through. It came to my turn, I got through. They got 21 through, I got 24 through. Well, that was it. That was the only thing in the case was uh, the cocaine. We, we went to the airport and uh, took it out of the car and then put it out. But there was a military soldier stood behind the, the conveyor belt. Mm. He just followed it all the way through. And then on the other end, it was just a kamikaze. Crazy. Yeah. So you said, uh, I heard you say, mention you end up getting three kilos out of doing the 24 kilos. Yeah. And made yourself 60,000. Was that enough to stop you doing any of the sort of kamikaze mule stuff? Did you use that as a sort of pop in order to yeah. set up we yourself? Yeah, we plotted up in Europe then once we got the money. Had our own apartments and things over there and cars. And just started working from there, supplying people really. Who was coming over from all over the place, from England, from so nice Spain. place. Rather than send it back, you were just giving them their stuff in Holland. Just having it there, yeah, making a profit on that. Even with the cocaine, that's how I got in with the Colombians a lot better. From going out to Ecuador, or Not just being from, based from in speak, Holland. It's being based in Holland, because in in them days it wasn't a case of the, the Colombians didn't have people there. They yeah. had they had the uh, they had the stuff in America, but in South America, but that's all they had. They didn't have transport. Obviously, they had some of their own transport, maybe the ones that we've never heard of, you know, too, too high up. But if you went over to them with transport, then they'd supply you with the, with the stuff. The transport was the main thing. Mm. And, yeah. So you managed to establish some transport at them times there? Yeah. yeah. And you were dealing at that point, so you were already dealing with the high ups in Colombia then, or dealing with some serious figures? I was dealing with Colombians in Holland. Yes. So, yeah, no. they were. You know, so you they, get, they'd come to you with 100 kilo and just say, what can you do with that? And just give it you. And then you just leave it with you. Obviously quite, a, quite large amounts as well in the end. Jesus. Just dropping off. So these times here, you must have stopped making serious money then? Yeah, I was making good money, yeah. And you were, ba you were based in Amsterdam? Yeah, around there. And so did you enjoy living out there then? You know? No, I moved out into the countryside. It was too dangerous in Amsterdam. Yes, uh, it's crazy, isn't it? You were all around the red light district. Yeah. It's like you get the most dodgy characters. It's There's loads of dodgy characters. You can get in trouble all the time. People off their heads all the time. And so you were still absconded? You were absconded, I was absconded, absconded from Kirkham. I was on but the But it's such a small thing. Well, you weren't too worried about that then at those times? No, no. So you weren't trying to keep a low profile because of this? So. No, no, it wasn't bothered about that. Because I mean, another main thing that happened while I was on the run when we were there is that what we used to do in between doing the drug dealing, we used to go about trying to get into supermarkets and things like that. But there was different supermarkets and they had just glass cabinets in the middle of the supermarket and the saves was in there and the money was in there. And we used to, two or three of us used to, two of them used to talk them away, distract them and then they'd want to go in and, and get the thing. So when we was out, was, I think this was uh, 87, 87, 88, uh, was out and uh, it came on top. We, we just got some money from a, a supermarket and the person that I was with had said something to a bloke pushing a push bike. Uh, you've not heard about this. He, pushing a push bike and as he was pushing it, he was an uh, off work copper on his way back to the police station. Two days before that, we hadn't heard about this that two IRA suspects have been caught at the border smuggling uh, explosives and guns. When the Dutch heard his accent, they thought again, straight away, Irish. Because when they think about Liverpool and Manchester people, they, they think we're Irish. So the, the, the alarm went out, it was in a stolen car, Toyota Supra. And I was pulled up at a set of traffic, like you sirens everywhere going off. And uh, one of them's come out of the, the side of the road through, through some bushes on a motorbike. And he's got in front of us, but he's left a gap. So he's put the sirens on again and pointed at us. He's got to get his gun out and everything. And I've gone out, drove out and set off. He's got back on his bike and pursued. So as he's pursued, he's started getting a bit excited on the bike. 
as we've gone round a really sharp bend, he's come round the bend and ploughed right into me. So he's hit the back of the car, flew over the car, landed on his gun, scraping down the road. I've seen, a bit strange to say, but I've seen the bottom of his boots. And he's landed and gone down the thing. So the call's then gone out, officer down, IRA suspect. So we drove off, got onto the motorway, two or three roadblocks, gone through one of them. And then we heard thuds in the car, that was the first two bullets. And we drove a bit further, a couple more bullets in the car. And gone through another roadblock and then there was a big wagging roadblock further down. So I've come back onto the, the motorway and the, the police are there, crouched, firing away another two bullets. So six bullets oh in the car. God. This, this was headline news all over all of the time. I can imagine. And, and Manchester, Manchester Evening News, it was there. And the, the, the headlines were two IRA suspects call, caught in Wild West shootout on Dutch German border. Because it was in a place called Assen in Holland near the German border, up that way. And uh, so we got caught, uh, got away, got through the chase, got through all that, went down the, the back of the embankment, jumped over a, a bit of a canal brook type thing and then ended up stuck in a field further down. But we we got away and ended up up a tree. I did, but about two hours later, they closed the circle, caught us, got us down, pistol whipped us, took us to, uh, I think it was Assam Police Station actually. Kept us in there, the, the, the passenger more or less got released within a couple of hours really. They were only, Dutch were only interested. Did you have fake papers on you or anything at the time? I had a false passport, yeah. yeah. So I was, like I say, I was, on the run for that and uh, ended up getting nine months in a place called Groningen who was Van Buuren. but in there that's where I met these certain Turkish people because what I didn't want to do was go back to England so I was talking to them and I said you know I could do with getting out of it because it, it, it wasn't secure it was secure enough for, for a prison but it had bar, not bars on the window the metal strips with squares of glass in it yep. so these Turks got me uh, a wire cutter in so I saw the bars away but on the third, the last bar I needed to go and it snapped so I had to wait for the morning they came opened the door took me to the police station because extradition now was wait for the uh, because of, of this so they'd, they'd become aware who you were no that yeah yeah they knew who it was then yeah so at that yeah. point there is while you were in there you hadn't been this wasn't in a triple cat A, obviously. No, this is just a normal. This was a light one. But it's called who is Van Buuren, just like a local jail. Yes. And, oh, so this is this is why the condition this is the second time, which we come on to down the line. As well, yeah, yeah. So you ended up managing to get break out then? No, no, I didn't get out. No, what? tried. So what happened then? It broke. Oh, and that's yeah, when everyone was waiting outside for me, but on the last one, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. Mm. And the noise that everybody, quite a few people knew about, they were creating noise to come for me. But really, I should have just gone out. Yeah, of course, and, you met, and especially you only had a few months waiting for you in England, didn't you? Five months? Yeah. yeah. And um, So they took me to Groningen Police Station. I bet you made some um, better yeah, links as well. While great contacts in, in there, in, in that world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, of course. Now yeah. you wouldn't want to say it, but yeah, fantastic contacts. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 everything led from there, really, yeah. from them contacts in prison. Holland's the yeah. supermarket of Europe, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, these, these people was, uh, like I say, Albanian types. From, from Turkey and they had so much money and power and thing even back then. So and the, uh, the Turkish, the, are they the um, representation they have best at transport and stuff like this, is that true? Or? They're good at everything, the Turks. Yeah. Strong thing in the game, they're powerful and they don't take shit from anybody really. Hmm. So they took me to Groningen Police Station waiting for the ambassador to come up and get me extradition going but he never came. So about three weeks into being in the police station after finishing the sentence, the, uh, the sergeant's come down, took me downstairs, I thought I was going for transport. And he just said, go on, fuck off. Threw me out, I had two guilders and no passport, no paperwork, nothing. In the streets of uh, Groningen in the top part of Holland. What a touch. Yeah. And to be, you obviously had friends at this point? You had loads yeah, of contacts there. Yeah, found people up and got picked up and that was it. Back, back into it again, more or less straight away. Nice. And so, um, do you know when you first did that first trip to Ecuador, like I said, obviously a couple of years previously, and you'd end up doing the mule and thing. From there, was it strictly just cocaine for you from there on end? Did you even waste 
I suppose you did yeah. end up getting the cannabis thing. Was the cannabis just sort of a the cannabis a thing was, on the side? Yeah, it, it was. A, it was a swap for a car. That's all. The, the forty kilo cannabis okay, yeah. got, it, got in the way. But when when we got when I got caught for my first thing, which was uh, the Curacao one, that was through a Belgian who was a transport man, and he'd done a lot of transport, but quite big ones, but mostly cannabis and bits of other stuff. And then uh, it, it, we'd asked him about couriers to, to carry it back from Curacao back into Holland. And, uh, so Curacao is a Dutch, it's Dutch and Caribbean Tellis, island. Isn't Caribbean it? island, yeah. yeah. So I've, I've gone over there and tried to arrange it, arranged it with certain people over there. We had no cover in Curacao, but we knew if you got caught there, it was okay. Mm. And it's just, Sorry, what, what, what sort of prices would you be paying for cocaine at those sort of times there? Because you get in Curacao, it's three thousand a kilo. Oh, at the God, time. still super cheap then. Yeah, it? it was two thousand in, in Colombia. Yes, yeah, so not that big. Well, two thousand delivered to the dock in Colombia. Jesus Christ! Then. I don't know what it is now. But the French still be cheap. But, uh, yeah, we got uh, came on top at, at the airport at Curacao, and uh, literally ran out of the airport there. Uh, and ran across out of Desert Island. Had to run across all this cactus filled fields and things. And he ended up in this uh, house, this stash house with Colombians waiting to get a new passport over, which took a couple of months. So I stayed there at 40 odd degrees for a thingy. So he's covered in cockroaches and. Uh, you further strengthened your link with most of these yeah. Colombians and stuff there. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's where I made the link with, with the, the, the one who came with me through to Colombia as well. What, down the line, yeah? Yeah, further down, there. Yeah. And so what, were these not sort of affiliated with the, the Cannes Cartel and stuff like this? Like these no, the, the, the ones in, in Curacao were just uh, privateers, really, I suppose. And so, you know, these times here, were you hearing about Pablo and stuff like this these times? Did you know, were you aware of Pablo Escobar at them times there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's making we, we never dealt with, with him at all. Yeah. Our, our side was af, uh, sort of, it was after. Pablo really. Yes. And the people we dealt with didn't like him anyway. No, the other side. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, so obviously at certain point you've ended up started to send, sending stuff back directly to England then, was it? The, no, so talk no. to me about how the, the six kilograms and the 40 kilograms of, yeah, so we, how that bus came around. Well, that, that we was in, uh, that was in Curacao. Okay. So yeah. when, when sent that from Curacao, that was sent, it was supposed to be sent by couriers but there was undercover cops so the Belgian had started speaking to people about transport from that world and somehow it got back to the English police undercover uh, and obviously they jumped all over it that people was bringing stuff from Curacao straight to England yeah, yes, this but that, that wasn't the route the, the route was Curacao Holland direct not Curacao Miami England it was supposed to go that way round, but yeah. because they into they they was the, the undercovers, they changed the route. Because yeah. what happened with them, those is that they applied to the Dutch to do the undercover operation. The Dutch said no, yeah. they don't do that in, in Dutch law. It's not allowed. But they still went ahead and did it. So they went on their own, uh, met the Colombians, got the the material, the six point thing, hidden in tins and briefcases, I think and came back but they flew from Curacao to Miami and in Miami they got arrested all of them there's quite a few of them involved watching the backs and everything but the two main people got arrested in Miami the deals was made and they got let through and it came back to England and then I got arrested in England so unlucky then <coughs> I know you were involved in some heavy stuff but the way that panned out and to get there yeah. So, any, so you're, then what happened then? You did extradited to? No, I got caught in England. You got caught, oh, so you, were yeah. you in England at the time? I was in England at the time, yeah. And got so caught. then, so what were you, so how did you get busted then in England? Obviously you used Well, I, I got caught for the uh, 40 kilo of cannabis. Okay. So I, I went to meet the people who brought that over. Well, I was close enough to it anyway. And uh, two, three days afterwards, was the cocaine was coming through and it was a, person who arranged the, the cannabis also arranged a cocaine deal and he was the one who was working with the undercovers yeah but, uh, uh, yeah so that, that was it Jesus so then obviously you've um, 
so then you've ended up getting reminded, I'm guessing obviously of something like that, and where, yeah. did, where did you get reminded to then? Strange ways. Stra strange ways, so where, strange where did you get nicked, did you say? Uh, Manchester. Oh, you got nicked in Manchester, yeah. yes. Um, so I went into strange ways, and it was just after the, the, the riots as well, yeah. they just opened it up again, and then they decided it wasn't safe in strange, not for me, for the, for the whole prison. And then they moved quite a lot of people out to police cells, so I did five months more or less in police cells. Mm. And then they ended up, as it was coming closer to it, they put me back in strange ways and then shipped me out from strange ways to Risley. And, and it was Risley that we escaped from. Yeah, yeah, so prior to that, then, obviously, I had you mentioned, obviously, that you knew that you were going to get a, a big stiff sentence yeah. there. So you suspected that you were going to get a 22, obviously. Prior. No, no. I heard you say, that's what you said. Yeah, yeah. That would be no, 22. At the, at the time. 22 is insane to yeah, get for. At the time, it wasn't. People wasn't getting that, but within a, a short period of maybe six months before I got arrested, nothing to do with me. This was general a change of the change of system. Yeah, and they more or less doubled sentences. Yeah, so it's within a short period. So I was one of the first ones to go. Uh, well, had I been in court, I would have been one of the first ones to go up under, the new under these new systems that have massive sentences. Mm. Yeah, and for six point three kilo, the twenty two years. Yeah, and because um, the cannabis was only a TIC, really. And like you said, at them times, there six kilos probably looked at as considerably more than today. In, um, in those days, and obviously yeah. it's pure stuff. I'm guessing it was coming it was from. Pure, yeah. And so it probably made uh, big headlines. So then, talk to me then about how you'd um, obviously you're not looking to do a 20 year sentence. So how would you go about trying to break out then? Um, got word to your pals. Again, it was different days. You couldn't do. It. I don't think you could do it today. But the, the, the transport system in the um, days was, it was an old coach. The, the prison officers was the ones who took you to court. Even when it was a serious case like this, it was still prison officers. And uh, yeah, just arranged for somebody to come up, pull up. And uh, it wasn't, my, my job, the, 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 the ground rules was that I had to get off the coach. Yeah. So the driver had to stop the coach. That was it. That's and what I did. Just stood up and said, "Nobody move," and nobody did. Yeah. So it wasn't. It was, was it an armed? No. It wasn't armed. So they managed to sort armed. of just block it off, and no. then the officers were scared enough to obviously just let you out. Without. Yeah, for a while they, they gathered the, the strength a little bit as I was at the door and mm. we jumped down onto the road. Then a couple of them had jumped on top of the other lad. Uh, he knew nothing about it at the time. I told him as I was, like I say in the documentary as he was walking up the stairs, and. Uh, yeah, we just got off and ran away, more or less. More, more of a cheeky escape than a, a violent and, thing. And so what happened to the other lad then who was with you? At, he, well, we got what did you do, chop picked him up there, chuck him out? dropped, got changed a couple of cars, and ended up going to Liverpool. Uh, I plotted up in a flat there for about four months. Didn't move, just, got, just got fed because of the Twitter. Because I watched the 22 years on the news at the, at the night time. Following day when it, we got sentenced, and uh, because obviously the sentence was in absence. Yeah, yeah. So you got out the day before sentence. Day before sentencing. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. and they still carried on with the sentences, and you're absolutely yeah, yeah. The, the judge wasn't happy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And obviously that didn't help. Did yeah. I think that could have given a, a bit more, but I don't think it affected it. That would have been put on at the yeah. end of the sentence for escaping and getting extra. Jesus that. Christ! When you heard that, 22 years, you certainly were. Yeah, I was, I was sat in a. A lonely little flat in the middle of Toxteth, just being fed every couple of days and giving me food and bits of videos and things. And so you. And then it took me four months to arrange to. The only way I knew, thought I was going to get out of there would be by private plane. I wasn't, I wasn't going to any airports or things like that. And so I waited for the right time, got a private plane out and flew to Holland. Mm. And um, so, how did, obviously, why you were on remand in Britain, strange, was it in strange ways you'd met Curtis? Yeah, in, in strange, the uh, first time I met him, the, uh, I, hear, I heard about him on the wing, and he, he was Cat A then, but uh, in strange ways, because it was my local jail, and I've been in and out of it all my life, so everybody, all the guards knew me, everything. Feel free to download the full podcast on all major streaming sites, including iTunes, Apple Music and Spotify. Also, check out the KRN store and grab yourself the latest KRN merchandise and accessories using the keyword KRN10 for 10% discount on all purchases. Thanks for listening and enjoy the interview. And uh, I managed to be able to get Kurtz out now and again onto the wing. 
I'd go in his cell and play chess and have a, a little chat. Mm. And then it started to work out that I'd been to the places he'd been to and you know, we just sort of hit it off together. And yeah, then, I can imagine two minds alike. Yeah. And then uh, I, I got moved to Risley, he stayed there. Uh, and then uh, the escape came. Curtis had nothing to do with the escape, but then he got moved to another jail. And then his case collapsed then, didn't it? And it was a few months after, once I was in Holland, that he uh, made contact and started working. Mm. And um, so were you working primarily actually together then? Were you partnered up with Curtis or were you doing your yeah. own thing as well as working? Doing my own Curtis? thing as well, as Curtis was, you know. Again, it's, it's this fallacy. People always think, oh, it's a big gang. It's not, they never are. It's just groups of individuals, really. You know, a couple of mates who've been together for a long time, and then you go and speak to somebody, oh, we can do that. Or you join together, but in, in the outside world, it looks like you've become a gang. Mm. Whereas really, you haven't, you're just doing what you do. And Curtis did what he did, I did what I did. Indeed. I, mean, I, was, I was good at travelling, and look, even being on the run, I had uh, a lot, a lot no, I got. Well, I'm a white Englishman. I can travel easily. You know, Proper so, passports and everything. So then you're sort of using these uh, Colombian links that you'd sort of established in the previous years and just getting the yeah the white gold sent over. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So you must have made again making incredible money then. Um. There's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of waiting. I waited six months on. A, I'm not complaining about it. On a, a, an island in Venezuela. I've tried a nice tropical island, waiting right. for things to happen. It's, everybody thinks you just go there and get it organised. It took six trips to Colombia to to organise this. So many failures of you know they're going to be there. It's not going to be there. It's going to be there. And then finally, when it does come through, but you've been there six months on and off on living on an island, waiting, hmm. you know, doing all sorts of mad things. We went to Victoria Falls and did parachuting off there and stuff like that but Fantastic. when we was in Colombia we was uh, used to go out on the, in the planes fly about and flew into from Colombia into Venezuela which was a bit naughty because it was a proper route where they just used to they told us that afterwards that the, the, mm. the customs found you they just shoot you down there wouldn't be any arguments you know, but you fly low across the, the trees over the Amazon and land in Venezuela mm. and um, so at these times there would obviously um, Will you be selling stuff to Curtis or brokering deals and giving stuff to him, or you'd sort of be? No, we're together then. When we're you're doing stuff yeah, together because obviously it was uh, reputed that when you were out there, you were brokering a deal for obviously the two of you. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, again, that's so complicated as well because there's so many people involved in it, which is the reason why you end up getting caught as well. Because you know, if I think about it, see, what, what, one of the things that happened when when I got to thing in uh, Columbia. So we've arrived, uh, the first time we, we arrived, the, the, the cartel had organised that when the plane comes, that they, they move the plane from the main Bogota airport and take it to the back and then get me off and take me down the back way, put me in uh, military police jeeps and take me to where I was going. Because it was, it was people, it was senators who was working with. So it's linked in with the government. Everywhere we went, it was armed transport. So by this point, you'd got to the right of the top of the cartel? Got to, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, it was up there. And uh, when I met the first time I met Lucho, he uh, met him in Bogota in, in, his, in his hotel, a big massive suite. And I walked into this room with, with my translator and there's about six of them sat around the table. And unknown to me at this point, this was the first time that they spoke to anybody about the capture of the 3,000 kilo. I didn't know, I was walking into a, a, a hornet's nest sort of thing and they wanted to know what happened, they didn't know. So what, there'd been three, yeah. three tons had been lost prior to... Yeah, one, 1,000 was the one that Kurt's got charged with yep. and another 3,000 separate, 2,000 in, in Holland yep. and another 1,000 in Belgium. My God. Uh, all, all of that went at the same time, and uh, but the Colombians never knew, that was it, everybody got wiped up and uh, I was the first one to appear in front of them. And I realised later that them questions that I don't know had the right answer, I wasn't coming out of that room. That was it. He was asking questions, how did you know, what happened, who are you, where have you come from, why are you stood in front of us? 
luckily because of who I was on the, the escape, it was documented everywhere. And there's blokes walking in and out of the room checking. I see him disappear and come back saying, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I want to know if it, the questions were wrong or not. My don't God. think I was so coming out some, of that room. You had some front on you, but obviously you didn't know um, no, about well, the situation you were going in. And you hadn't no, done any wrong. No, I hadn't done any wrong, that was the thing. And yeah. that, that's the thing people won't realise, you know. You hear about the club and being monsters and everything, but if, if you're at it yourself with them, then they're going to be thingy. But if you're straight with them, they're going to be straight with you. It just turns into business for them. Always has been. And so your um, dealings with the Colombians then were quite civil and business-like then, yeah. didn't have. Yeah. And so Lucho was a, a good guy then, obviously, super serious guy. Yeah, like but, the time but, He could facilitate a broker, obviously. Like I said, you got busted. There was 400 kilos that came across, but you talk about a ton there, two tons there. Yeah. Time there. So well, yeah, we, we was building up with the 400. That was a start. That's, that was the beginning, and we was talking about things that was going to get a lot bigger, obviously, mm. at the time. But uh, it all went wrong. Yeah, so obviously when something gets busted, the Colombians are happy to write that off as long as they know they haven't been yeah. screwed. Yeah. Um, and so you're talking about you were getting it at certain points for two or three grand a kilo. So by the time you sent it back, it was. Profit margins must have been absolutely insane when you yeah, got loaned through to Europe. Yeah. Plus, it, it wasn't it wasn't just in the, in them days. What the, the deals that you could do was that they supply the, the thing, we supply the transport. Okay, well, half of it is theirs and half of it is ours. So what you just go fifty fifty on what comes back? And yeah, but then you'd also get the opportunity to sell theirs as well at a, re, a, a better price, and they'd be able to get for it. So you'd make on, on their side of it as well. Fantastic, and obviously at these points there, obviously I'm guessing the greed got the better of you and this you obviously could have put away at them times, because you had a, a good run between 93 and 96, was it? Yeah. Yeah, we had a very good run, but we also lost a lot of money as well on other runs that failed completely. So was but, that was that runs where you'd be buying it yourself separately, in some, yeah. separately from the cartel? No, and no. always with the cartel, but we're still putting extra on for ourselves. Yeah. Because uh, I think anybody who went over there with uh, a couple of million dollars would be foolish. I'd give it to Colombians and expect them to deliver cocaine there. I'm just going to take the money off you and that'd be the last of it. Yes, yeah, so you'd never pay up front for the stuff. It was always after sale when it came. Always after. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's always down to them. They, they supply the, the thing and deliver it to where you wanted it delivering to mm. and put it in whatever you wanted it put in. And so let's talk about. Um, 96 then if possible when it all sort of came on top for you in Holland um, mm. obviously there was a load that they were obviously tracking um, they said it was over 400 kilos what was it 420 kilo 420 kilos yeah. and how did this come on top then do you know uh, undercover uh, not undercover undercover English police first on the, was this through the phones in Holland, through the phones yeah so yeah. Did, did Curtis think that he was out of England's net and they weren't going to be fussed with him yeah. if he disappeared from Andrews. Yeah, we, we, we didn't know at the time, I didn't know, Curtis didn't know, that you could use the recordings in, in Holland. Yes. So everything that was said was not only listened to, but part of the evidence against you. Okay, so yeah, this is why it ended up getting, even though it was the English police help, but this is why it was a Dutch court case, because yeah. it can't be used in Britain, as we know. Yeah, we tried to fight it because we, we knew that the English had come, had come over illegally. Yeah, and plotted up on the house, so they must have had information in the first place, or been able to triangulate Curtis's phones, because mm. the house in Sassenheim was sort of out of the way as well. And uh, we, we come, one of my friends had come one morning to play golf, picked us up, drove down the road, and he, he said he'd seen a couple of different strange cars. There was Dutch cars, but they had people in. And the, the way that we went to the golf course was like a horseshoe and it came back on itself. So as I've come back, I've come back onto them and seen them driving up the road. And when we came out of the road, I could see that there was struggle. I knew there was, there was English because it was lost. It wasn't Dutch. Dutch people don't get lost in their own country. It was English. So from the, from the golf course, because they had to go all the way around then. And uh, by the time they come all the way around, I was on the way to Paris. Mm. Just went straight to Paris and uh, stayed there for a bit. So was this, 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 I'm guessing they were timing this at the day when the 420 were coming in or was it where this No, this was way before, this was way before, before the Dutch oh, so was knew, involved oh, in it. You, yeah, you knew yeah. it was on top at those times, yeah. way before. So, 
because then I'd, I'd moved out of that house yeah. and I left everything behind, didn't yeah. touch any, anything, just drove straight to Paris, moved about Europe for a bit and then eventually came back and moved into the house that I got arrested in, Yes, which is in Newark and, and the Eisel, which is... How did they know you were in that house? Uh, right, yeah. you were alone. Again, again, just listening to the phone calls and triangulation, they said that they used, because on, on the night before I got arrested, you know, when that second sense, of sixth sense, whatever you call it, yeah. As I was outside on the phone to Curtis, a car drove past on the road, but the, the road where I lived, it was a farm. And there was two more other houses further up. And these blokes again, you know, you, you spot it, split second as you drive past. Should have, should have listened to me thinkers, but it was the following morning that we got arrested. Yeah. So um, they was on the phone. And um, so of these, 420 kilos, so that was this going to be, was this Curtis, was this yours, what was it? Yeah, true, it was part of it. Yeah. yeah, and then you guys were broken, it's going to be... Well, after it go straight back to the Colombians. Yeah. So, and the, the rest of it was, was ours. Yeah, to do what to see fit. Yeah. Um, and so how much money, for example, would you make off a deal like that um, come in? Do you not want to say? Well, you're going to be looking at over a million, aren't you? Jesus. Straight away. Overnight, really. It's a quick deal, quick deal like that. You can do. Yeah, that would be gone in Holland at the time, that would be gone in a day. And is that breaking it up or is that just. No, too... I just sell a lot in one go. And so, how many people are there that, out there, though, that can buy that much stuff? Quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, quite a lot. But it wasn't a lot for Dutch, that. It was, it was minuscule. Yeah, yeah. So we only was... found that out later on when I was in the prisons, in the, in the Triple Cat A prisons, and we found out. What, they were sending multi ton loads for them times oh, there then? Yeah, there was. Uh, because you see it in the paper a lot now, but I didn't realise there was th that bigger loads coming through at them times. Unbelievable amounts. There was, there was an operation going on at the same time as us. Yeah. And I often, I still think that uh, I was one of the people thrown in so the bigger ones could come through. Yes. And it was called the Dutch ERT affair. And that was that involved, and I, I know this is absolute truth because I met the man in the Triple K. He was on my wing. There's only three of us on the wing, and he was called Colbus, the King of the Gypsies. And uh, he had a get out of jail free card, well, a letter from the head of the ministry, and he said, "Tell us who they are, and you can go home. You can even keep the money that you've got." And the money that he had was in the millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions. And that was involved with the, the top people in the customs, top people in the police. Uh, all came tumbling down, but they never got the top people. Mm. And uh, they was doing 22,000 kilo at a time. Read it up about it, ERT affair Dutch. Unbelievable. They had houses full of money, stuffing it in bin bags. Jesus Christ, that's always been how it is today. And, and it out. wasn't one container full it was quite a lot I think 12 altogether that they knew of and it was thinking that's when the price dropped to about 12,000 a kilo in Holland but that was true the, the, the you know it wasn't the, the street kids from Manchester it was the head of the chief and the, the, the customs and the police yeah and the police was moving about for the criminals and then when when I got into the triple K in Utrecht in uh, near Vosselveld that's where I met uh, Colbus, the King of the Jews. Mm. He, he had uh, a couple of million guilders in his bank account in prison. He used to buy food for everybody on the, well, everybody, it was like me and me, the other lad who was on there. He used to buy all our food and everything. Mm. So you ended up, um, like I said, it was a real heavy arrest as well when they came through your house. Yeah, when they came, it was all explosions and things. And getting dragged out of the house naked. And Do you think you're going to get killed at that point when the explosions yeah, there, coming through? There, there was a few moments uh, a few seconds, you know, where you don't know who it is. Don't you know whether it's police or criminals or someone, but it was so quick. And then, then we find out that there, there, was, there wasn't police who came for it, it was like military, called the Astarte teams. Mm. And so at this time, so this was 96 then, did you have um, your son or anything at this time? Did you have family? I mean, what was the state back in, back in, in, in England, yeah, but they, they was with the, the mothers. Yeah. Oh. And so I always kept my family out of my business. Indeed. None of them knew it was a big surprise to all of them when it happened. Jeez. Even even to the girl I was living with. She thought I was selling boats. You know, but you can't involve them in it. You know, no fair play. If you yeah. tell them something, it's going to yeah. end up hurting them. With the it, it, well, it's like today, the, the people who, who get involved in the crimes, they do the crimes, but then they use all the family to 
to buy things and move the money about. Yeah, I've no, just seen including that. them all in, in, in the conspiracy. Just, just seen it a few days ago, someone local my way, he just been nicked on a big conspiracy, but then his mum, yeah. his sister, and his missus have been nicked because obviously he's put everything in their names. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, um, that, that's how we, we worked in those days, we kept it to ourselves. No, that's the best way. And so, um, so in 96, then, like I said, they come through this super heavy arrest, and you've ended up being remanded in Holland, then originally in a normal prison? In a normal prison called Grava down uh, tucked away near the German border. Was this with uh, Curtis? And no, Curtis right went, there? so I don't know where he went. I'm not, I'm not spoke to Curtis since that time. We never even, I'll tell you this in a bit, but we never bumped into each other apart from one time. Yes. Which was in the Triple K. And about quite a few staff lost the, the jobs for that. Mm. You know, they're not supposed to mix in, in those places. So did you guys engineer that? To no, 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 it was just, just their movements, yeah. Uh, yeah error on their part. Yeah. So then you've ended up, um, so originally it was a normal jet and then the police from Britain got in touch to say that this guy's on the run on a super serious uh, prison. Yeah, that, that's when the, the, the lies from the English died where they said that it, it escaped from an armed police transport with machine guns, uh, a gang of criminals with machine guns and rocket launchers. Yeah. And uh, I always, uh, well I know why they did that, they did that so they could put us into that position where we was triple K. Because under Dutch law, we, at 420 kilo, we were just normal prisoners. We was nobody special, especially when you, you hear about 22,000 kilo cases and seven containers full of cannabis and you know stuff like that. We was baby criminals, so we would have ended up in the normal system. Yeah, I mean, a seven-year sentence does it sound like it justifies the triple. Oh, no, even, yeah. even Curtis's because he was uh, he had he got caught with a lot more stuff. It was only 12 years. Yes, you know, for that amount. Was that they gave me seven years and I had to appeal because Curtis was appealing. Luckily, obviously, they're quite they're super lenient with the holiday yeah. with their sentences. But it, it, when, when I appealed with the seven years, the, the, the judge says, I can't believe that you've come in front of me to appeal. Yeah. Really cheeky what you've done. And chucked a year yeah, on. But he was room. laughing when he was saying it as well. Yeah. You know, it's a different thing over there. But it's crazy because obviously you were on the run for a 22 year sentence for yeah. six kilos of cocaine plus yeah. a little bit of cannabis. And, but, uh, in Holland, you've ended up getting a seven turned to eight for a 420 yeah. kilogram. And then they knew, it, 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 I suppose, when I, when I was listening about the, on the trial day, he was saying, you know, I don't really want to do this, but I had to do it, the judge, the Dutch judge, because yeah. then he, he knew that it was going to be consecutive. It had to be consecutive because, you know, the, my solicitor says, you know, you know what you're doing here, don't you, Your Honour? You, you're giving this man, he's going to be doing 30 years in prison. When you add that to his 22, he said, but I remember the judge saying, yeah, but what can I do? You can't let people escape from prison and nothing happens to them. You know, they, that's a sentence. Yeah. It's consent. Which is supposed, when you look at it logically, it's right, isn't it? Mm. You can't let everybody get away with everything eventually. Yeah. And so like I said, if you moved to the Triple Cat Age, I know it's like a not a pleasant existence. Like I say, there's two other people in your wing. Yeah, well, yeah, when I first got there, but we, they moved us to the, the old one, which is a, a concentration camp called Vught, uh, and it was modernised. But that's where the, the, they moved the Jewish people out to, to to the concentration camps, and it was a small concentration camp itself. How they've not knocked that down? It's, it's an historical building. N now it's it's complete, but it's it was inside the prison, so the, it was already a, a serious category prison, and then inside that was, prison was that. Prison, yeah. Yeah. And uh, everywhere you went, it was triple door. You had to go through a different system, strip search, practically every day. Proper strip search with everything off. There's no messing about. You know, every time they told you to bend over, they bent over with you. Mm. You know, everything was, and you never moved, got moved. It was only always one prisoner being moved at a time. Everybody else had to be locked up at that time. Yes, yeah, so there's but no that, chance of keeping your finger in the drugs game. Then in those sort of conditions, then there's no way off. No, not not under there. We, we got one phone call a week for uh, 10 minutes and was literally inches away from a, a, an officer stood in front of you while he was on the phone with headphones on and cuffed up. Mm. That was it, you got 10 minutes. But to get that 10 minutes, you had to put an application in to the judiciary who then sent it to the parliament and then whoever's name it was then got sent to England. They went to the head of the police there and to the parliament. They had to go around to the house and actually speak to the people to make sure it was who said it was 
yeah. and then you got permission to speak to them on the phone and then it took six months to, to arrange a visit through doing the same process. My God. So, and every, every visit was behind glass, oh closed, recorded and monitored, strip search before you go on it, strip search when you come off it. And I mean total strip search where you just stood naked in, yeah. the, in a room. And that happened every, every visit. So there must have been some um, real low moments for you in that Yeah, point ter there. terrible moments of, uh, I don't know what you call it, not, not so much desperation because you know you're technically safe in yes. them, them places. It must feel like your life done at them points there where you've obviously got yeah. a eight, just got an eight year sentence in Holland yeah. and you know you've got a 22 to go back to hanging over you it must just feel like it's hard to see past that at that point there yeah because it was the 22 was that two thirds at the time as well yeah. when that new halfway system came in last did you not feel like um obviously get, did you appeal the, the yeah, english we sentence yeah, while you were in holland still we were you trying to appeal the no i couldn't appeal the english sentence until i got back yeah but even then that became a problem because it was out of time and being out of time in, in law, is, is, that's the end of it. Okay, so it has you know, to be within a... It took me 14 years to get a final decision of appealing. And the, the final decision came from Europe. Mm. And at the bottom of it, it said, this, this appeal is no longer appealable after that. So, in other words, that's the end of the line. Mm. Don't, don't bother. And, uh, yeah, because there was a lot of... Uh, how should I say it? There was a lot of wrongdoings by the police. But... Uh, in the end, the, the, the statement was made by the, the English police and the, uh, the English judge and the Dutch judge that uh, even though they committed crimes of police, the end justified the means. Yes. But um, prior to that, obviously, what led to the rest was it due to you being um, wrapped up around Curtis and then yeah. times? Because obviously he was so high profile after what happened. On the through. phones all the time. And thousands of phone calls. Yeah. And three phones at a time. and. And so even if they didn't weren't aware of him and they were listening to some of the people in England, they were going to catch him at a certain point on the phone. To... Yeah. So yeah, it's just too much to It's inevitable, isn't it? When you when you when you in the cold light of day, when you think about it, and especially in this day and age. But even then, they was able to monitor phones anyway. Yeah. So it's inevitable. You're on the phone all day long, and somebody's going to listen somewhere, aren't they? And pick pick it up. Yeah, you just got to, to complain some four years away from it, or even after what had just happened, if yeah. Holland was. Yeah. And so, talk to me about how you got through that the Holland sentencing. Because, like I said, those first few years of guessing were the worst of yeah. your time in. Well, like I said, when, when they moved us to the triple cat, that was Christmas Eve. But uh, again, you know, in all sorts of circumstances, there's always a bit of light at the end of the day. And my, my light for the end of that day, in 1996, Christmas Eve, was that I met a, a young Dutch lad called Frankie Peters. He won't mind me saying it because he's still in prison now. And uh, as, as he's been let out through this, well, you have to go through nine doors before you get to the kitchen. But only one person can be in the kitchen and they put a tiny little knife through the slot, which is just big enough for, for the knife to go through. And he cooks us a pizza. You know, life becomes better again straight away, doesn't it? Yeah. A little bit, compared of to where you was, but yeah, he cooks us a pizza. And uh, I stayed with Frankie for all, all the time that I was there, really. But he, he was a mass murderer. Jesus. Nine Turks and uh, uh, a Dutch bloke. And was it was he a serial killer or was he? Uh, it was all drug related. Drug related. Yeah. Jesus Christ! A he, super dangerous. Guy. As a young boy, did all that. Yeah, nineteen. Yeah, his his, uh, his case is still running, still fighting the appeal because he, he got yeah, uh, right. what was called twenty two years. And it's was, it was called Frankie the, the the Bender from Venlo. Ben, Bender means gang, not as we say it. Yeah. Vendor from Venlo, and uh, there's, uh, there's films made about him. My God, uh, getting you out of the car getting, with police. You end up getting close to him. Bit, yeah, you? he was a great lad. He was just a kid, he was 19. And like I say, he's still in jail now. Have still in jail now. Yeah. Had any contact with him? No, uh, yeah, I've had bits of contact, but not yeah. much. I'm not allowed to contact uh, people in prison. Okay. I'm still, I've still got a year on my parole to do that. Mm. And so, um, during the time in the Dutch jail, were you uh, getting back into your art at all at them times? Straight away. Straight away, they don't, they don't let you sit and uh, fester in Dutch jails. They give you opportunities. And even in the Triple Cat A, I was getting one-to-one -one art classes. Really? Awesome. Yeah, yeah one -to -one. I was going to ask you if that's next yeah. question, if you were self in, in the same place where you get the visits. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you actually have 
good art teachers coming in. And great art teachers coming in and started me off straight away, so, and they also allowed me certain things.